Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for the special panel, which is rounding off Resident Advisors January Wellness Month offerings. Uh, my name is Chloe Lula. I'm the managing editor of RA, and I'm pleased to introduce this discussion, which is called Winter of Care, Alternatives, Tools, and Strategies to Support Ourselves and Each Other. Uh, it's been organized by Ecology of Care, which is a new ongoing series about community care, harm reduction, and mental health for people in communities who are often at the fringes of society. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to RA and Ecology of Care for having me. Uh, my name is Gerald Boyd, um, and I'm going to be your moderator for the panel tonight, and just a little bit about myself. Um, I'm from the U.S. originally, uh, but I've spent the last 16 years here in Berlin, Germany, where I'm based out of, and I have a background in linguistics, and um, I've worked in education for the last 15 years as well here. I shifted the focus of my work to anti-racism allyship and advocacy about uh, three years ago. And um, that's what I'm bringing to tonight's discussion. And also I can't, uh, I can no longer introduce myself without positioning a little bit. So um, the lived experience that I bring to the table tonight is I'm a black indigenous queer woman. I grew up in poverty in a highly segregated city and I am also able-bodied cisgender. I benefit from being straight passing and having light skinned privilege uh, to name just a few things. So that is also a part of my um, presence here with you tonight. And um, to give you a little bit of a content warning, um, because we're going to be talking about uh, the pandemic this evening and how it has affected mental health in communities that were already vulnerable. Um, we'll also touch on practical strategies to cope with isolation, building alternative networks and channels of community care, harm reduction, mutual aid. But it's important to recognize that uh, the topics in and of themselves might be activating or triggering for us. We're all still going through collective trauma. So if you need to, please step away from the screen come back when you're ready. Uh, tonight's discussion will also be available on the RA YouTube channel, so you don't have to force yourself to be ready before you uh, already, uh, before you really are. Just take the space that you need. And we also want to take time to acknowledge that um, we have a lot of wonderful panelists from a wide array of communities this evening, but obviously uh, our views today represent only certain aspects and not the whole spectrum of points of view on these topics. So we are informed by our own lived experience and our individual research, but obviously no one person or group of folks can know the complete gamut of experience. And um, please know that Ecology of Care continuously strives to expand on this and to take all feedback into consideration in its future iterations. So feel free to reach out afterwards if you have feedback for us. And without further ado, I will let our lovely panelists introduce themselves. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pick one and then you can tag the next person in. <laughs> so uh, let's give it to Polly Cakes. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you, All right. Thank you, Ecology of Care. Um, my name is Polly. My pronouns are they, them. I live in New York City. Um, I grew up here. I uh, am a DJ. I'm an artist. I've worked in every facet of nightlife that you can imagine. Um, I'm the co-founder of Disc Cakes, which is a collective here in New York that um, throws raves, uh, does um, mutual aid, work, fund redistribution work, um, pr creative production, and yeah, we're also working on starting a label soon. Um, and yeah, I, <laughs> I'm not the best at introductions, but yeah. Um, it's okay. not easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm a bit nervous. I'm like ah, I'm not the. It's like 11 a.m. here or 12. I'm not the most morning person ever. But okay, I'm gonna uh, pass the mic to Rafi to introduce himself. Thank you. Thank you, uh, RA and Gerald and Ecology of Care for uh, having me a part of this panel. I am Rafi. 
Uh, my pronouns are he, him, they, them, but he, him. <laughs> um, I am an artist uh, organizer in Berlin. Uh, I lived in New York City before now. I've been here for almost four or five, five years. Um, I, my experience in community organizing started uh, briefly for a time in New York City around uh, safety and nightlife. Uh, and when I came to Berlin, I found uh, a pocket in the queer feminist electronic music scene and started to um, collaborate and work with uh, a festival called Whole Festival. And from 2019, I have been um, sort of collaborating with my peers and community around harm reduction in nightlife. And I am part of T.S. Raper, which offers peer-led harm reduction and awareness in nightlife. Um, in my other life <laughs> as a parent, uh, I have two kids um, and my studies are mostly around uh, alternative um, methods of community models of care. Uh, and so that means like decolonizing the uh, privatized uh, alternative health industry. So I have an interest and I study integrative health, medicine, neuroscience, neuroacupuncture, and I'm invested in those in my um, daily life. And yeah, they translate a little bit into the work that I do in nightlife. Um, although in the last two years, it's been quite uh, on and off. And so we've been trying to find ways into Sraver to bring um, community care to the digital space. And that's why I'm here today to share some of my experiences and views. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafi. Um, and also, if I mispronounce anyone's name, please let me know. <laughs> Kimwa, you're next. Thank you. Um, everyone's doing such amazing work. It's, yeah, already amazing to hear it. Um, my name is Kimoy. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm originally from New York and I've been living in Berlin for about three years now. I am a psychodynamic counselor and sex educator, and I host a monthly support group here in Berlin for queer BIPOC individuals. Um, what else can I say? I guess I'm relatively new to community organizing um, outside of my clinical work. And during the pandemic, I've done some organizing around um, fundraising to make therapy accessible for Black queer people. Um, yeah, and this was a project that was going on through 2020, but generally this is something that is really important to me and I imagine future projects kind of targeting the same issues. So yeah, that's me. Thank you very much, Kamoy and everyone. Um, I guess we will jump right in then if you're ready to go. And to let the um, viewers know, the participants, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of the panel discussion. So um, we, while we do have folks monitoring the chat, um, if you have any burning questions that you'd like to ask directly, um, by all means, we'll, we'll have uh, time at the end. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna start. And we're coming up on two years now most of this pandemic. And um, uh, the first question that we have for you is, what is currently, in your opinion, the most needed in terms of support and care um, for the folks in your respective communities? And if whoever wants to start first, by all means, like what's, what's top of mind right now um, at, in 2022? Um, I could start. If, and if, if that's cool. Um, so when reflecting on this question, the first thing that came to mind here in New York and here in Brooklyn, I, I currently live in um, Brooklyn, New York, and I, I grew up uptown. Um, I definitely would say finances are needed for a lot of folks um, here because for many of us, you know, living off of our 
are living off of our truth, living off of our creation is a leap of faith, especially for people who don't have a secondary, you know, educational background, who come from marginalized backgrounds. And there in New York, there's little, there's very, very little support for artists. There's very little support for gig workers. It's not very legitimized by the city. And when, you know, when there's surges of, you know, when there's surges of the virus, we all lose work. Everyone is left to just take care of one another through mutual aid funds, through re we, us redistributing our funds to one another. But I think that there really needs to be some kind of secondary support network that's actually coming from people who have an abundance of money. Because when this has been happening, you know, over the last two years, it's been us with our, the little bits of money we have, the little bit of time that we have because we're worried about survival, supporting one another. And I feel like there aren't, there isn't much help from, you know, secondary institutions or institutions that might benefit off of our labor or our image or our, you know, our work. There's, there's none of that. So I think we definitely need more support and just like, money like money so we can create money so we don't have to worry about our rent have to worry about squatting have to worry about getting kicked out um and then secondary secondly what came to mind was i feel that at least here in uh, new york in my respective community there needs to be more gate breaking um which is a terminology that i learned from um uh, organizer and dj raver jinn um, on Instagram, they create, they made a post about gate breaking culture, uh, a post to gatekeeping culture and what that is and how we can benefit from that. And some examples of gate breaking include free food, skill sharing, um, hiring without college degrees or extensive CVs, um, sharing health tips, um, just creating more resources so that we don't have to rely on a government that is constantly failing us. And I think that for a lot of us, once we feel confident in our day-to-day -day survival, we can live in a way that feels authentic and, and true to us off of what we can offer to society beyond a nine to five capitalist perspective. So those are two things that I thought that are very much needed within my respective uh, community here. Thank you, Paul. Um, are there, is it really easy to find access to where um, people can donate to how we uh, give the money that you um, said the community needs most? Um, will those resources be, or those references rather be available? Um, I mean, when it comes to community aid funds, they're here and there, you know, because when they're like, for an example, like there was a huge uh, Omicron outbreak here in New York in the beginning of December and hundreds of people got sick, hundreds of people were out of work. There was there were no paid sick leave for any gig worker or freelance artists that I knew. So people were just setting up people like like that organization is just people setting up fund redistributions and you know we can only sustain that for so long until we run out of money to redistribute or we run out of bandwidth to run these things so I mean as of right now I don't know of any that are directly aiding people in nightlife but there are some incredible funds like monthly mutual aid funds that are putting you know commissary money in incarcerated folks commissary in New York and I could share some of those um I could share some of those you know through I sent some through the link but there's like the friendly commissary fund and then uh there's another fund here in New York called the breakfast club which uh basically provides free meals for people out on Myrtle and Broadway which is like a, a very busy intersection here um and people you know so there's there are grassroots funds and independent funds that people are creating, but there are no like, there's no fund that I know of right now that's like, just like, like distributing like 
you know, monthly, like that, that's distributing like every week or whatever. And then there's some Instagrams too, like uh, my friend Adonis just created an uh, Instagram called, um, I believe it's called Give Black Funds. And it's, uh, they share like folks's, well, black queer folks's like um, fundraising posts. And they use this Instagram as a hub so people can go and like donate and then have everything in one concentrated area. So I can include that in the comments. So people have like a direct link. Cool, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, an, a resident advisor will be providing uh, more resources as well as ecology of care after. Uh, Kamoy, I think you wanted to speak next, is that right? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to kind of go off of what Polly was saying, this first point that they made about um, finances or financial support in general, I find is so important. And in my clinical work, I'm seeing a lot of people who are coming in and a big part of what they're dealing with is financial stress and financial instability and housing insecurity because of these things. Um, and they're really looking for not only mental health support, but also practical support with these very real issues. Um, and that brings challenges into the work because if these kind of very basic human needs aren't being met, then it's kind of difficult to do any kind of psychological work on top of that. It kind of, yeah, there's an insecure base to, to build on. So I think that is a, a big issue. And kind of like what Polly was saying before, like mutual aid is great and it's amazing, um, but it is also a lot of um, emotional effort um, from people around the, the kind of individuals taking on this task to organize and then sometimes funds run low so I guess I mean I don't have answers in the larger sense but I know that kind of more financial support is needed on like a larger scale not just kind of within the community or from individuals so, yeah. absolutely yeah but yeah, I mean, I think that this is uh, really super, this is like massive to talk about. I'm glad we've like jumped right out with this because the, um, you know, the financial instability in the gig economy is, I mean, in the United States, there's no, there's zero benefits, like Polly said. And so it's uh, this chronic, already there's the, the stress of uh, spreading the virus, right? And this fear coming from the media, and then we have this chronic stress of not having money and so this kind of these things they people think they exist outside of us but they we hold it all in our bodies and so your communities become sicker and sicker and the thing that i think about um especially when you know people are jumping to mutual aid uh at least at the beginning of the pandemic not forgetting the kind of um the redistribution of this wealth and who has the hand who's who's collecting it and how are they replicating state violence by deciding who gets what. And so I think it's super duper important, um, at least in coalitions or forming uh, mutual aid efforts that the people who, who are the people that are saying, self-electing themselves to do this work. Oftentimes I find, you know, it's real important to make sure that the voices of the community that they're speaking to in need, there can mirror that. This is my community. And I think being uh, here in Europe has given me some ideas about this. Uh, and I think that there's oftentimes a lot of people speaking over those who are most in need and deciding where that money goes. And so we need to uh, understand that, you know, if you have that much access and that much privilege, stepping aside and sitting down and letting the flow of money go where it needs to go can not just help with the financial crisis of it, but that uh, holding that in causes uh, more sickness and more illness. Not, not only that, because we don't have money in our bank accounts to pay our bills, uh, we're staying up late, we're not sleeping, we're not able to take care of our children, childcare. I mean, I think about childcare a lot because I have two kids. And so you sacrifice a lot of time and mental energy. And so I think it's like prioritizing equity, basically, among our community um, and understanding and those who want to help with 
with access and privilege, understanding what is urgent and what is long-term and how do they fit into creating this, uh, coming up with the ideas and the solutions around mutual aid. Um, because I was a part of a collective uh, here in Europe that mm, at the beginning wanted to collect a lot of funds and then had a lot of rules on redistributing it that I didn't feel was fair and equal and didn't have equity. And so I think it's important that the voices in these mutual aid efforts are those of the community. And I think that can help actually create power numbers and policy outside of that in your community right next to you can change. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Yeah, thank you for adding it. that. That stepping down part I find is um, surprisingly difficult for a lot of folks, no? Um, and that also touches upon the, what Polly said about the gate breaking, right? This idea that, um, yeah, you've got someone potentially outside the community, potentially in the community, regardless, deciding who is worthy of what and, and how, yeah. Uh, I love what you said also about um, we hold everything in our body. That's something that's also so overlooked. Then... Um, Next question. Um, this is, one is directed specifically for Kamoy in terms of the mental health profession um, that you work in as a psychodynamic counselor. Um, and if you could share with us maybe um, some idea about how the nature of your work has changed um, with how it changed with the oncoming of the pandemic to start and then how the changes evolved or mutated even over the past two years, particularly given all the ping-ponging with rules, lockdown, no lockdown, and the emotional roller coaster that comes with that. Um, that's a really good question. I think, <clears throat> well, for me in the beginning of the pandemic, it was a really interesting experience to, mm, I guess it was my first time working clinically with some, with a topic that we were kind of all going through as a collective, um, before, you know, before in my clinical work, I feel as if my, the topics that people were coming to me with were very were varied, you know, uh, across the board. Um, and when the pandemic started, it was this really interesting experience of, you know, my clients coming in and asking me like, oh, how are you doing? Uh, just out of care because they kind of knew the pandemic was affecting everyone and also affecting me. So then it was me trying to, or really, yeah, I guess strengthening the way that I kind of held that space and like made it a secure space for them to like come to and not feel as if they had to then care about me as well. Um, so that was interesting. Also kind of knowing that all of my clients were in one way or another being affected by the same exact thing at the same exact time. That was interesting. Um, and like I mentioned, <clears throat> there have been people coming in in, a, in in crises, whether it's about um, financial stress or, you know, just emotional stress, depression, anxiety, these kinds of things. But I feel as if it has really, you know, over two years, it's really kind of waxed and waned. Like there have been periods of times where it really uh, felt like everything felt super urgent. Everyone was in a crisis. Um, and kind of now what I've been noticing in my work is that things, that element of being in a crisis is a bit less at the moment. And maybe we've reached a place where there is a lot of, or there's more, I should say, space for introspection and reflection. And I have, I'm seeing a lot of people coming in um, wanting to get, you know, a deeper understanding of themselves after having spent a lot of time with themselves or um, in their relationships, whether that be like romantic or platonic, but really trying to understand how they function, not only within themselves, but in their interpersonal relationships as well. And that I think has been, has been really, yeah, kind of beautiful to see in a way. Because like I was mentioning before, it's kind of difficult to do this deeper kind of psychological work and reflection when everything is so alive and, you know, you don't know if you'll be able to pay rent, you don't have any jobs lined up. 
Um, so yeah, it's been, yeah, there have been so many different phases, but I feel like those are the kind of things that stuck out to me the most in terms of, you know, my clinical work before the pandemic and during the pandemic and now. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, and this is for you and uh, Rafi and Polly as well. Are there any tools or coping strategies that you would like to share with us? Um, either something that you yourself do that you recommend or that you recommend to clients or friends um, or just something you know has worked with other folks in your communities? start. Um, I think for me now, I'm still not uh, completely 100% on what, what will get me out of um, certain states into more relaxed states. I, I think that um, immersive tasks be, helps me to refocus um, my thought processes when I'm in let's say a kind of a state where I feel like I'm triggered or I'm reliving <clears throat> an anxiety, whether it's financial health or otherwise, because um, I'm quite, I practice social distancing quite a bit myself, um, having two kids and also being someone who lives with autoimmune disease, I'm tr often hypervigilant. And so I, my practice for myself is finding something to refocus uh, my attention. Uh, to help sort of break the retelling of whatever it is that I have going, the loop in my head. And I find that recently I decided to sort of have uh, prioritize this mental downtime and sort of limit the amount of influx of social media because for many months um, at the end of the summer, I fell into a pocket of an intense, uh, I would say socializing again and in the, the work that I do with Taste Raver, I found that I really was trying to do everything all at once and it wasn't working. And so I needed to kind of prioritize this mental downtime. And I guess what I mean by that is also sometimes, I don't know, like you're shampooing your hair and then you have like a kind of like, oh, I have this, you know, I'm, that's mental downtime. And so I have some moments of creativity or allowing my brain to sort of chill out and relax. And that's really hard to do. Um, I know it's not easy, but those are things that I like to do. And um, I think looking at my perspective coming from uh, a disability informed, disability justice arts, uh, like Mia Mingus talks a lot about access intimacy um, and there's you know, open access spaces and the virtual world, we can also relax into this call for instance, and be comfortable in our bodies. And I really think that that is something that I try to prioritize in my own space, being able to loosen up my body um, and yeah, try to help bring down my trigger, my triggers in a sense and lower my stress response. And that can, you know, we're talking about practical things like uh, walking meditations for me when I walk my dog. I, do sound, sound meditation when I'm walking. And that's paying attention to specific sounds. It could be the leaves rustling or cars going by, or even just the chatter of people to sort of quiet down my amygdala and things that are just like going, how am I gonna pay this bill? Or what am I gonna do about this? I feel a twinge in my chest, am I getting sick? I know this is a constant state that everybody is in. And then I can, not just individualize everything all at once. You're like, actually, I'm part of this global pandemic and I can calm myself down. You know, I, I think that those are things that can be helpful. At least they help me. Um, and I know we talk a lot, we use, sometimes we talk a lot about the feeling and sometimes the solution is really, can be really simple. Like we say, diaphragmatic breathing for instance like what is that belly breathing you know if we can't uh visualize uh, a relaxing um space when we close our eyes if that's not safe for somebody to close their eyes and visualize a happy place just having some control and breath is actually a really powerful way to bring control and 
have some predictability in your life. And that's, that's, those are the things that I try to focus on that have helped me. Yeah. Okay, so that was a quite a few getting in touch with your surroundings. I'm just going to sum up for everyone. That, so that sort of like, me, yeah, I mean, I think it's about, in a nutshell, my, my point is like, it's so unpredictable. The world is so unpredictable right now. And the way that we can lower our stress response is creating predictability and control. And those, I think, are so small, small additions. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Either control within yourself or control with how you are receiving the, that external uh, input coming in. Polly, were you? Did you want to? Yes. Um, I, something that has been able to keep me grounded um, throughout the pandemic and just dealing with a very unpredictable lifestyle beyond my control um, has been praying. I began praying daily um, during the thick of the pandemic in 2020. And through my prayers, I'm able to express gratitude for something, for powers that are beyond society, beyond humanity. And being able to express that gratitude and give thanks has been a constant reminder for me to, has been a constant reminder to me that, you know, there's a purpose beyond capitalism. There's a purpose beyond, beyond like feeling sad and feeling, you know, like, like in curled up into myself and through prayer, I've been able to understand that even the things in life that, you know, are traumatic and are, you know, difficult to cope with, such as the pandemic, have a, a larger purpose um, that could help us find a greater good. Like, I, like reminding myself that there is, you know, there's a light at the end of everything. And through destruction, there's always reconstruction. And through destructive forces that enter our life, there is always a learning lesson from that that can uplift somebody else. And being able to try to remember to move with that framework has been able to help me immensely and have been able to uh, uplift me out of times where I feel like I'm just in a really, you know, stuck in a, in a really bad place, having that gratitude and remembering to pray and remembering to affirm myself and to affirm those who've come before me and to affirm those who are with me has been able to really, really help me uh, a lot throughout, throughout the pandemic and just rem like gratitude, gratitude, writing what I'm grateful for. Even when I feel like the world is closing in on me, remembering that I'm grateful to be able to, you have a sun over my head, the moon over my head, um, an ocean here on earth creating an equilibrium, like reminding that there are things beyond our existence has been really, really grounding for me. Um, and I think, you know, living in New York City, growing up here, like things move so quickly. Things move so, so quickly. So when the pandemic first hit, I think it was like a huge wake up call for a lot of people where like, life can move a little slower and it's not all about just the hustle the go from one job to another job like constant survival mode like although like that time was extremely traumatizing and a global catastrophe it was also on the other hand a time to slow down and recognize that there's more to earth than just nine to five go 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 like we need to slow down and have gratitude and remember that you know, like um, Rafi was saying, like things live inside of our body, like things that we experience live inside of our body and we have to hone into that and pay attention to that. And also just remembering to focus, you know, rekindle my relationship with my, my intuition, with my, you know, my, my body, not just thinking with my brain constantly, thinking with my heart, thinking with my gut, thinking with these other, you know, parts of ourselves that create contribute to our holistic wellness has been something that has been really helpful for me, you know, and I think when it's difficult to, it's difficult to focus on anything but money when, when one is in survival mode or like 
survival when that's like what all you have to focus on. And I think, I just, I think that has been really, really, really helpful for me. And, you know, and I, I recommend prayer and 10 minutes of expressing gratitude to all my friends, regardless of, you know, who they're praying to, just that acknowledgement that there's more beyond society's order that we have to unfortunately adhere to. Um, so yeah, that's been really helpful for, for, helpful for me. And on a more tangible scale, like just waking up and drinking water, making sure to drink water, focusing on my breath, like simple things, you know, like I think like with this, this capitalist approach to wellness culture where everything has to be bought or you have to like look a certain way or be a certain way or talk a certain way in order to engage in wellness culture is such a facade and wellness could start with just waking up and drinking a glass of water and thinking you know to ourselves wow like I'm so grateful that I'm able to drink this water like this water is a conduit of like love and happiness for me or just you know like Ralph was saying like taking a walk walking your dog outside and like meditating and just giving thanks to what has been provided for us beyond anything material. Um, and that's been really helpful for me. And I try to talk a lot to my friends, you know, who are also working in nightlife. Like it's a very consuming field, especially like DJing and, you know, working at the club. It's like, it feels like there isn't that much it's it's a very like it's a very like non-conventional lifestyle. So I try to think about ways that can help like somebody, I don't know, other people who are working in nightlife and just working these like really fast lifestyles that are equated with like burnout and destruction. Like it doesn't have to be that. Like there are ways we can cope um with living these lifestyles and also uh living holistically and you know being stable. So yeah, that's a very interesting point um, that we actually will touch on again a little bit later. Uh, Kamoy, would you like to share any? Yeah, so just to clarify, so the question is kind of what things have been working for me throughout the pandemic to kind of stay grounded. Anything that was worked for you that you recommend perhaps to clients or that you know you've not tried yourself, but you know has been very successful with others. Yeah, any sort of coping strategies like uh, what okay. Yeah, okay, so I guess I'll start with myself then. Something throughout the pandemic that I have been kind of spending time on that's been really helpful for me is um, kind of bridging this connection with my mind and body and kind of delving more into breath and movement and developing my yoga practice. Um, and this is something that has really, yeah, supported me and kind of staying grounded. Um, and I guess it also ties into to what I would recommend um, <clears throat> in terms of uncertainty I feel like right now there's so much um, uncertainty about the future and um, there's a lot of people trying to figure out how to um, kind of cope with that uncertainty and I think uh, what Rafi was saying that also brought to mind what I wanted to suggest is um, just elephant elements of mindfulness and intention um, so for me the kind of um, bringing attention to the breath or to movement is something that has been super helpful because I can only think of that in that moment, right? I can't think of all the kind of what ifs about the future when I'm really focusing my attention on my breath or on moving. Um, so with that being said, I would su suggest, um, yeah, for everyone to kind of explore and find an activity that brings them that feeling, if that's clear. You know, meditation can look like so many different things. Mindfulness can look like so many different things. Like Rafi was saying, even kind of like going for a walk, but, you know, not having your headphones in and being super mindful of all the noises you're hearing around you, the sound you're hearing around you, that could be something even like, I don't know, like cutting some fruit or something, prepping something for you to eat. You know, you can 
like really focus your attention on that in that moment. And of course it's moments at a time, but I think this is something that could be really useful to kind of um, bring your nervous system down a bit and just keep you maybe at a more stable um, state of mind in your, in your mind and body. Uh, yeah, that's what I'll say. Nice, thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap in all of your different um, approaches to it. And in general, it's um, perhaps something that has come out of this is that we see these things as necessities, as things we need and not as luxuries, right? And this idea that, yeah, it doesn't have to look like a certain thing. I, I legit sometimes just stare at a blank wall and like, if that's what I need in that moment, like to help just kind of process and clear, then that's totally, uh, absolutely okay. And it doesn't have to look like you said, like meditation doesn't have to look like a certain thing. Like the rules are all kind of made up anyways, right? And that's something that we've generally been able to unveil um, throughout this whole pandemic. Thank you all very much for your responses. Um, now I'm curious about your communities, um, larger communities. So keeping in contact with both, um, not just your immediate circles of friends, but other folks within your community when we don't have these usual physical spaces of socialization. Have you done that? How have you done it? And has it been particularly challenging or did it end up being surprisingly, you know, there's a lot of readiness and a lot of people reaching out or of course it comes in waves too sometimes, right? How have you kept in touch with your, your larger communities? I can start that one off um, by saying that, yeah, it's something that has been challenging for me. Um, I think I'm, well, I know I'm in touch with community in terms of my work because I'm typically working within queer communities and within um, Black, Indigenous and POC communities. Um, and this is something that has been, uh, yeah, consistent throughout the pandemic. Um, I have also been practicing social distancing, um, what can I say, pretty strongly. So I think this has created a, a barrier in some ways, but something that I have found helpful is um, communities online. Um, and that has looked like, I guess, doing things that are new for me. Like throughout the pandemic is like my first time ever getting into video games. Like maybe this is like a little way out of the mental health. Um, but yeah, I got a switch and got into gaming and found some like on like online communities on like Discord and stuff where I still feel like connected um, to people. And I started learning um, American Sign Language with this amazing queer sign language school in like Canada. So that has been really nice to kind of meet with people around kind of learning, like learning sign language is something I've kind of always wanted to do. And again, the pandemic kind of like gave this opportunity for me to do it and be able to like do it online. And that has been really nice to, yeah, connect with queers from all over the world, different parts of the world um, and kind of, yeah. And having that connection there around kind of like specific things, but yeah, there've been, yeah, it's been a meaningful experience for me. So yeah, that's where I'll leave things. Anyone else? I uh, I would just want to say thumbs up to the video game uh, Worldwide Connect. <laughs> uh, yeah, I also, uh, you know, social distancing has been, um, yeah, moving these relationships into a place where they're like not, hopefully not um, feeling totally blocked. I found it somewhat challenging, especially with some of the um, things that I have, but I did find um, going online and playing video games. Also my children play video games and it was a nice way when there were times that we had to uh, be apart from each other, we were able to connect. And so I think um, what I'll say about that as well, just in a broader sense, I think that we, 
I, ha I have heard, and this I'm sure you have as well, uh, that if we're not in physical space, then we don't, we can't share intimacy. I mean, that I think is something that really is, uh, needs, we need to disrupt that thinking and that there, you know, if we're looking at things uh, through disability justice, we need to understand that before the pandemic, people were already social distancing and were isolated but that doesn't mean that they lacked the capability to build intimacy. And there are ways in which you can do that. And I think that there are creative opportunities for us to still, in, as we're in the pandemic, to build intimacy through these um, different means of connecting. Um, I'll a way that I have been able to connect with many people through uh, my community in New York and also the broader, you know, community, broader communities is definitely through like, like during the pandemic, people were doing like virtual raves, um, which was really cool, like Zoom raves and like just digital, digital raves where we can like still share music with each other and share these like moments of, you know, of joy. And like, obviously it, you know, it's, there's there's nothing like dancing like you know or being with someone like in person but you know I think these were really beautiful ways to like share intimacy with people without um having to put anybody at risk um and yeah a lot of folks were doing that and it was also giving like DJs an opportunity to make some money during the pandemic or people like it, giving us like a resource to like raise money for like other people um so yeah that was that was really cool like the zoom raves and like the digital the, the digital raves i think that was like a great way to connect with people um through the pandemic thank you very much for sharing um for folks who are not as um into so we say socially distancing because there's you know there's a lot of varying um reasons why people including mental health reasons um feel that they can't establish that uh intimacy that connection without the physical space other than the obvious dangers of infection, do you perceive any potential dangers um, when community members meet outside of the usual public spaces? So things like online raves, et cetera, at home, maybe um, doing things in parks. Uh, when we would go to parties, particularly in here in Berlin, there's also there's often formal structures for medical support, harm reduction, awareness team, sex education, right? Do you perceive any potential dangers in people pursuing um, a sense of community in smaller self-organized situations? Or have you do you know of anything firsthand, perhaps? Well, in terms, I mean, I could speak uh, on behalf of my experiences organizing parties and raves and, uh, you know, I've attended a, um, a bunch of forest raves and outside raves and helped organize some um, in the last three years. And I think for me personally, when I throw events, I like to think of nightlife here, specifically uh, the queer nightlife that focuses on trans non-binary folks um, and uh, LGB folks. I like to think about that kind of organizing as creating an ecosystem. Uh, and within an ecosystem, you know, there needs to be food so people can eat. There needs to be water so people can hydrate. There needs to be some kind, sort of medical attention in case there is a, or like there needs to be paramedics rather, EMTs in case there's an emergency. Because when um, I throw events and like when my, you know, folks that I collaborate with throw events, one of our many goals is to keep spaces, to keep, is to keep spaces safe from calling law enforcement for any reason. 
So when wanting to do something like that, you have to consider a lot of different factors. You have to consider, you know, you have to think like what can go wrong and how can we, how can we mitigate something? How can we mitigate an issue before it happens? And so this was a model that I also saw uh, happening a lot in the summer of 2020 during um, the protests and the uprisings here in New York when people were organizing protests, they would um, have a, they'd have structures to these protests where they'd have uh, medics, they would have uh, marshals who would volunteer to surround the protest in case uh, police would come and they would, there would be people who would volunteer to be on the front lines in case of, you know, in case something were, happen were to happen, they put their bodies in front of others. And these structures of organizing were, were super inspiring to me for throwing parties because especially when throwing renegade parties, people are at risk, you know, if police shut it down, like they could hurt somebody, like someone could get hurt. Like we need to constantly be thinking about how we can protect everybody in a situation if we wanna put ourselves in a position of creating a space. Um, and I like to think about it as being like, almost like a parent, like protecting my kids if I'm throwing a party. I'm like everybody there, I have to make sure if I'm gonna step up to create these spaces and I need to step up to protect everybody's safety or try to, pr try to create a space that people feel safer in or they feel braver in and they feel good about themselves. Um, and yeah, I don't know if I'm, if I'm railing off of the question, <laughs> but I just wanted to bring that in there and uh, talk about, talk about that, you know, cause personally, like, I think, you know, I was the like digital raves were keeping me going during the pandemic. And it was, I was feeling a lot, it was amazing to feel connected to like people without putting them at risk of the virus and feel connected to like my friends abroad. But it, I would just, I wouldn't feel good mentally after being on my computer for that long. And like, I'm not like, I'm not gonna lie. Like I, I would, I would, it would make me feel like I was in my room and like, doing these raves or like being on my computer like for all this time and being in my room for all this time it made me want to like you know over consume drugs or alcohol or whatever it is it made me feel like like I needed to feel human connection and I think that's something that definitely like hasn't been spoken about a lot you know I mean like I can't I know there's kids who are doing online school now and I feel like I haven't personally heard about like any conversation around like what that could do to somebody mentally um so yeah i just wanted to share yeah, these thoughts in my experience in the um the educational system from what i know personally working there and i'm um, from friends who have kids it's not it's not being thought about at all there's still this push to perform and produce um, and what it's like for a, a small mind to stare at a screen for several hours a day is not being taken into consideration. Absolutely. Uh, Kamoi, Rafi, did you um, want to add anything to these uh, dangers or, or actual perhaps like what to do's as um, Polly mentioned a lot of instead of the what not to do's? Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I thought about in this question was the uh, Apolli, they, they, you brought it up as well. Is this um, a lot of the patterns of habit change for people during are still going and uh, in the pandemic? And how, uh, in terms of if we're speaking about harm reduction, and at the end of the summer when parties started up again here. Um, it's a really fine line between recreational drug use and self-medicating. And so I understand uh, that needing that space um, to go and to discharge and to release and to connect and uh, to figure things out, work things out. But I think that um, I wouldn't say dangers, I'd say more like concerns. Uh, and, without personalizing it, but I think it's about creating environments where if you're a promoter or you have a venue or you're 
say you're not throwing a party or you're doing something else, um, you have to think about like, there needs to be, this is why I think awareness teams are so important is that they, they don't just, they are, it is an alternative to the police. It's an alternative to, um, you know, a rush uh, to giving accountability away and removing liability. And I think that it doesn't just have to be something for the club. It's something that we can use as a framework in our daily lives, wherever we are. And that consent and creating a new environment, uh, wherever that may be. Sorry if this is like too abstract as I'm saying, but using those same ideas and tools in other environments, I think are really important. Um, yeah, and I think that we have to lower our, our stress responses. And that's not something that we will, we're still in a pandemic, we're still going through it. And I think we have to think about what is urgent and what is long-term um, and having a space to name and say, this is what I feel and having a, a community of people to hear you and to respect that also and say like, I need to dance. I need to let loose. I need to break free. And for there to be that, and for that environment to be supported. Yeah. Um, just quickly, because you mentioned it and, and Polly also brought it up, this, this not calling the police, that not being our first go-to um, and bringing these um, strategies that we know in social spaces as alternatives, um, like awareness teams, et cetera. What does that look like in a non-party, non-club environment? Like how do you bring an awareness team into your daily life or what other um, alternatives do we have from calling the cops because nobody wants that, it shouldn't happen. I think it's about sharing skills. I think it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, it's about these, um, there's also pods that I'm, I'm sure for me, Amingus also has the, the Bay Area just as they do pod mapping. And um, I think that also has to do with sharing skills, sharing resources, knowing what they are, how to get people to them. And I think that in terms of this, uh, what you just asked, it's about um, having information available and those um, project lets uh, comes to mind. They have a lot of online crisis intervention training, which um, they offer and they're, that are available. And I think it's important for these to be everyday skills that, that we all can engage with and learn about. And I think that's another thing. Uh, Kamoy, you're talking about learning sign language. And I think that's really interesting. One of the things that I kept writing down was just like adapt, being able to adapt and adaptive learning. I think a lot of the environments can that we create can, we can create a place to skill share and to learn from one another, what our resources are. They're not just financial or whatever, They're, they can also be skills and we can learn from each other. And they might, they might look like a, a crisis intervention training uh, or even just sharing interpersonally. Um, it doesn't have to be something really massive. It could be a few people sharing skills. Um, yeah, I think I got like my brain just went, but yeah, that's. That's great, thank you. Come on. Um, uh, well, as Rafi was speaking something, I was thinking about, sorry, let me get my thoughts in order. Um, you were asking what can this look like outside of like a party setting and then Rafi was giving um, some examples and I was wanting to add to that something and I think I got this from Rafi as well so I'll give credit to them but um, things like bystander training um, I took this really great training I think this um, this organization based in New York like that's something that comes to mind just how to handle 
or the different ways that you can handle a situation, you know, where you see someone is uncomfortable or maybe you see, you know, a potential for violence or something like this. How could you diffuse this situation without having it escalate and having a need for like authorities to be called or something? Um, and even um, knowledge around uh, harm reduction when it comes to, to drug usage and things like this and what to do in case of, um, an emergency or a potential overdose and things like this. I think everyone having that knowledge could be of a, a great benefit to, to any space, right? Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Well, what maybe this is not maybe this is not related, but something that I was thinking about as everyone was speaking is also the um, like this time throughout the pandemic where you know we're in and out of parties being allowed here in Berlin, it's not at the moment. Um, I'm thinking of how that gives us kind of the opportunity to explore what coming together in community can look like in other ways outside of partying. Um, so whether that be kind of uh, sober space, like intentionally sober spaces where people come together around, I don't know, any specific kind of like hobby or craft or just sharing space, you know, um, what could that, what could that look like? And is there room for kind of intimacy to be built in, um, in these kinds of spaces as well, even if it's not a designated, designated sober space? Um, because I feel, hmm. Well, this is like a, a, a much bigger point, but something Rafi was just saying as well is how it can be a thin line between recreational drug usage and kind of having a good time and then people using drugs to kind of numb, numb feelings, you know, and I think in my clinical work, at least I was seeing the kind of impact of this in the beginning of the pandemic when there was no access to partying and there was so much uncertainty about when it would even be a possibility again, kind of seeing the people who were struggling in those moments, not because of the lack of connection to others or lack of intimacy or something, but lack of kind of um, access to, to kind of party spaces that, it, that kind of, largely revolve around drug usage, kind of seeing people kind of cope with that and what that means, I think really brought that um, to the forefront of my mind, the kind of need for sober, for sober spaces for queers to connect and kind of build intimacy, even now during this time, you know, in the ways that feel safest for the individuals and the, the least amount of risk. Um, yeah, I'll end there. <clears throat> Absolutely, thank you. Um, maybe Polly or Rafi, you also have um, other alternative suggestions for, um, you know, so we've got the idea of, of um, knowledge sharing, um, which is very, you know, the, the heart of community um, going all the way back, right? And then sober spaces, any other suggestions about building um, community-based support systems, maintaining community care networks, um, and also things for, you know, though some folks are skeptical of therapy, mental health is really demonized still, um, and also in our respective countries, the US and Germany, it's not, there's not easy access um in a variety of ways so what are the um yeah any other alternatives to uh maintaining community support and like mental health support that you can think of um, some uh something that i've been thinking about is creating an overall narrative of being able to step up if you feel uncomfortable um, and being able to talk to somebody. I mean, I know like within nightlife and also within, you know, day jobs, there's, there have been uh, times where I felt uncomfortable or somebody has done something to make me uncomfortable or something discriminatory. And I wouldn't feel um, comfortable talking about it because I know that that would cost me my job or my money. And so, Something that I've learned, I try to diminish that by when doing a parties or events is by, you know, if somebody's getting tickets or like before the events or like even on like Instagram posting a kind of like guideline that lets people know that they can, if they feel comfort, uncomfortable, they can speak up, they can speak up to somebody and having like 
uh, monitors or P uh, safety monitors or somebody you could talk to that could, that could intervene so somebody doesn't have to put themselves in an immediate danger by interacting with somebody who's making them feel uncomfortable. Um, so I feel like having those kind of like conduits uh, are extremely helpful and also create you know, there's there's a lot of talk about safer spaces, but I read, forgot where I read this somewhere. Uh, somebody said we need more braver spaces along with space, uh, safer spaces, braver spaces in which people feel comfortable speaking their mind and it, uh, they feel comfortable speaking up if they feel uncomfortable about something, you know, because there are a lot of spaces which me, which may seem, you know, like they're, you know, putting in work to to avoid a, a nasty situation. But if somebody is experiencing harm and they don't feel comfortable speaking to anybody about it because they don't feel like it will be met with uh, receptiveness, then, you know, what's the point? What's the point of it? So I think just overall creating this uh, non-judgmental, non-biased, open uh, conversation and invitation for people to speak their mind and to to even critique without having to feel like they're doing something wrong is really important. Um, and I think, you know, one way that can be done through is through, you know, creating uh, guidelines or affirmations for folks who are coming into the space that you're inviting them to. Uh, so that's, that's one thing I was just thinking about um, beyond only nightlife uh, within other spaces. And I work at, uh, a venue here in New York called Nowadays, which has a really cool model for mitigating uh, harm. They have, they, there are people who are safety monitors who work there, um, who are trained in some form of de-escalation and harm reduction. And we encourage uh, patrons to speak to a monitor if they feel uncomfortable, and then we can communicate to a security guard for them, or we can, um, we can help mitigate the situation between them and the person or we we're just there to help we're there to help and sometimes you know i know in nightlife or whenever out like sometimes people don't have the capacity to always address things and they they shouldn't they shouldn't always have that capacity there should always be someone there to help um and just letting people know that if you can and have the capacity to that you care and you're there can completely change somebody's experience in a um, in a, in a certain environment. So I just yeah I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. I I totally agree with everything uh, that you just said, and I think it's also about having. I mean, maybe I'm just repeating what you said, but these private spaces, having private spaces uh, where there isn't a punitive action or uh, an expectation for someone to outsource their, their problems. I think that's also, uh, I've heard in my experience, I've heard so many times, oh, just so, well, they need to go, they need to go do this or they need to go to the hospital. And, you know, I'm sorry, but that the, the experience that queer and trans people, black people, brown people have is that it's worse than before asking for help. And so there needs to be that private space or that warm line or that, that knowing that where whoever uh, I'm going to with this, it is a private, it's private and it's an alternative way of communicating and I can be heard and I'm not going to have um, a punishment for uh, a mental health crisis, whatever it may be, whether no matter the circumstance. And I think that those are really important uh, for our community. So. Definitely, thank you. And I, I would like add to that. I feel like the, the next step then is also um, trying to normalize being human in our spaces and all of them, not just the safer ones and not just the private ones, but this idea, you know, like we're always um, punished for having emotions, for having to deal with something. And now that we're all collectively going through something, like maybe there's time and space and like mental capacity to, um, you know, say like, 
hey, you're not being unprofessional because you feel something while you're at work. That's not, you know, that was a way that we were taught to not be human or, you know, you're sharing something personal about what's going on in your life at a, in a social situation. You're not being weird. It's not awkward now. You're just being human. Um, and that kind of like taking away the shame of just being a human is so essential um, that we've got to you know, just normalize that, like start in our communities and then just like if, by, you know, by force, just like make it happen by just doing it, by saying it, by just being right. Um, I'll ask you for one, I'll ask you one last question so that uh, we have time for the Q&A. Um, and it's again, it's uh, just more sort of tools and tricks um, uh, because as we do have these waves of like being able to be in more contact and, and, and you know, if hopefully, you know, this, this is the last wave or we, we get to go back to what resembles um, a kind of life that we had before in a lot of ways in terms of social interaction. Um, how do we manage our social anxiety or agoraphobia, a fear of infection that may not be, you know, practical anymore, but is still a fear. All these mental health issues that might have newly developed or simply become exacerbated, gotten worse with this pandemic. Um, what would be the strategy there that you would recommend? Um, um, I can start. I think something like what I would say to that and something I try to encourage my clients to do and also myself is um, be patient with yourself and allow yourself um, some ease because yeah, the pandemic is still going on and things are kind of changing each day. And I feel like throughout it, although there have been periods of kind of really strict lockdowns and things being more open, there has kind of constantly been this push to like be okay or like push to perform and push to kind of um, be like, I don't know, have the same amount of energy as prior to the pandemic or, or meet those, have those same standards, even internally. I think definitely externally, there's that expectation of, of, oh, you should still be kind of meeting these same standards. And I think this is something people can struggle with internally as well. I, I know I do for sure. Um, so yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's such a big thing. And because the pandemic is still going on and a lot of these things are still new, I would say um, be patient with yourself, allow there to be some ease and small changes are more sustainable than very large ones, right? So kind of to, if you are looking to make a change in your life, I would suggest, yeah, starting out small if you're afraid or if something like agoraphobia is developing and you have high, high anxiety around going outside, I would say, yeah, start off really small, you know, like walk around the block or even, you know, walk outside of your flat kind of thing and just be gentle with yourself and however that process goes. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's what I'll end with. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to support that and the, what I talked about before with the dis, uh, disability arts is the relaxing into spaces. And what you said, Kamoi, now is allowing a bit of ease, <laughs> even if it's just a bit. I think that, that is, um, I think it, it helps us to come up with, uh, you know, get rid of this, uh, these expectations that we have. Uh, over ourselves, over whatever class we're doing, or whatever project we're working on, or the pressures from the outside. So I really like that. I really like that a lot. And I, I try to hold that. Um, I think, oh, sorry, I think my computer is like glitching out a little bit. One second. Technical difficulties. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties. Oh my God, one second. We can hear you fine if that's the concern. Okay. Uh, okay. 
So uh, I think like, um, like jumping off of uh, what you two were just saying, like easing into things is so important. And also just understanding that the path of like, like the path of stability or what, whatever is not linear, like nothing in our life or the path to like happiness or like normalcy, whatever that might be. I hate that word. Um, it's not linear. Like one day we might wake up feeling sad and that's okay. We can't be hard about ourselves on it. Like sadness, anxiety, these things are natural human emotions, despite, you know, how, how demonized anything, but seeming okay is these are natural emotions. I mean, me personally, when I feel anxious, I take that as a warning sign that I need to remove myself from a certain situation that I'm in or that I need to like make a little small change. Like, you know, maybe if I feel anxious, I am I need to walk over to somewhere else and like, or drink some water. Or if I'm sad, it's my, my body letting me know that I need to you know, I, I need to change something or I need to do something nice for myself. And I think we live in a society that, that like, you, like you were saying, um, demonizes like human emotion and demonizes anything that is not societally acceptable. And understanding that these are, it's, it's okay to feel other things besides like completely like happy or normal or like, like together all the time like if we look at the ocean sometimes the ocean is extremely calm and uh warm and the waves are moving perpetually and calmly and then sometimes there's tidal waves sometimes there there's huge waves or if we look at the wind you know sometimes the wind is calm and then sometimes it's blowing over trees like nothing is linear and sometimes not feeling okay is just a natural part of our experience as a human and we can't be hard on ourselves about that and I I think like now in this uh digital age where you know most of us are using social media and we're you know processing like like all this just like hyper overload of like other people and like what they like let seemingly perfect like having a good time like we need to not compare ourselves to that and we need to not use uh social media as a a realistic uh perception of of reality because i know that's something that definitely uh, messes with me you know if i'm feeling upset and then i look at instagram and i'm just like look at all these people they have it together there's something wrong with me and that is not reality like social media is not reality that is that's a hologram of somebody's existence. <laughs> like, um, so I think just keeping those things in mind and not being hard on ourselves when we have an off day, you know, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's okay. Like, it's okay to not feel okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even that is part of it, what you're saying about social media, everyone only posts an illusion of what their life looks better like where when their life looks best right because we're not allowed to show the bad mm -hmm. stuff and when we do god forbid if someone shares something about how they're not doing well what are they they're seeking attention right they just want attention like it's just that social media is just, or how 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 social media social media itself is not evil again like most tools that we have at our disposal they're not bad on their own like at the heart they're neutral they get used though for for you know evil purposes and that's a great example like it could be a good thing but just that that those systems and structures already in place mean that we're like using it just to make each other feel worse mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, to everyone. We have a few minutes now for questions um, from the from the viewers, the, the participants here in our little panel discussion. If anyone wants to um, type into the chat, if there's any questions for any one of us here. I got so many thoughts <laughs> listening to the, the four of you and, and so many very interesting information and maybe something I have discovered over the past months and I was in this situation with one of my neighbor and 
really didn't know what to do. Uh, so this neighbor just took drugs way too much. Um, and obviously the other neighbors took the decision to call the police um, because they wanted to have help, great way to help this person. And was discussing about the situation with a lot of people. Uh, something I have learned uh, very recently is that actually in this case, if you really have to call someone, obviously call an ambulance, and when you call the ambulance, um, never say that it's because of drugs use or abuse, um, because then the police is obviously coming directly with them. Uh, and if you say on the other side, oh, these are the symptoms, I don't know what happens, but I see this and this and this and that, then chances that the police follows the, the ambulance are lower. It happens sometimes, but not always. And I think knowing that was already really helpful. And I wanted maybe to share that with everyone is like, if you are in a situation where the only option is calling an authority, then choose the less problematic authority, choose an ambulance and don't say it's because of drug say, I see someone collapsing and I don't know what it is. Um, that's the only thing I wanted to share. Uh, and again, thank you very much for all what you said. It was so... Yeah, that's a very useful tip. Thank you, Tamar. I'm not sure um, how much that varies from country to country. I know there are different rules, but I think it's, I might be remembering this incorrectly, but I feel like I think in the UK, they automatically send the police. Um, but yeah, it's a very like a uh, bureaucratic um, uh, thing from country to country in any event, but it's certainly a useful thing to try um, to avoid that, that oh, so we have usually more harmful intervention, intervention that causes more harm. Anyone else? I wanted to say something in response to that. Um, I under I understand the scenario in that in that situation, but I think actually one of the things that I think about when I hear stories like this is um, why isn't Narcon widely available? Why um, are drug testing and drug kits only uh, created for and drug users? why we should have drug testing kits and Narcon and people should uh, have these uh, access and tools readily available um, uh, for preventative safety planning. And I think um, it should also be, uh, it shouldn't just be for uh, what people consider substance misuse. It should also be for recreational drug use. Um, and I bring this up because now, um, with the pandemic uh, and, and, and the drug trends, um, people are getting their drugs from sources that are unreliable and they're trying new drugs. And actually fentanyl has actually made its way into, although it's in small scale, uh, into, into Europe. And this is a huge devastating problem in the United States. And um, when we did our T.S. Raver, Threshera, um, Tag the Club Culture Day, we had someone bring this up and it's really important. People should know how to use Narcon, it should be available. There should also be um, more uh, widespread drug <laughs> harm reduction information. Harm reduction is not just uh, for people who are have substance misuse, you know, it should be for all. And um, when we learn those, back to the skill sharing part, when we learn those things we can better identify an overdose and to potentially mitigate the harm that someone could encounter. Although it is very scary and I understand why somebody, and I'm not saying don't call the ambulance, but I just wanted to, to mention that, that we need to also think about changing policy and et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. Don't have enough time. We need a whole another hour and a half for this, sorry. <laughs> At least, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Um, there's, yeah, exactly. We're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but everything you just mentioned um, as an alternative to uh, having to call an ambulance um, as well. It, again, it's going to vary from country to country, but we will do our best to put all of these resources um, that will be followed up on the resident advisor feature, the subsequent one about this panel, um, as well in the Ecology of Care website. Also, you know, I mean, Mia Mingus names so many things were mentioned. Um, we'll do our best 
to put together a comprehensive list of resources and it will be available to everyone um, watching tonight. And yeah, thank you again um, to the panelists for participation, the audience for attending, to RA for hosting this event.